Freedom is an interesting thing. It's an interesting word. Uh, as an American, I would say that my home culture, that word freedom would probably represent the value that we as a country uphold as the highest value. Whether it should or should not be, it's a different story. I'm just telling you that that's probably my country's biggest thing. Um, I remember leaving home at 17. I don't know when you left home, or some of you haven't left home. Um, and feeling free. I don't know what, what you felt like when you left home. Feeling like I could do whatever I wanted. Feeling like, ha ha, I'm not at home anymore. Woo! And, I, and, and this feeling of being able to do anything. Um, I also discovered right away that having the right to do everything didn't give you the means to do everything. It doesn't feel very free when you're broke. Like, oh, you can do whatever you want, but you can only do what you can afford. It's funny, I think the first thing we want after we get freedom, we want freedom, we want freedom, and then after we get freedom, we're like, oh, we want cash. We want wealth. We want, we want a way to do something with that freedom. On top of that, oddly, my whole time growing up, I'd already had a lot of freedom. I'd been free growing up to do most anything that would have been beneficial to me. I was free to do most anything that would have helped me or made me stronger or made me wiser. I was free to do all that stuff already. The stuff I wasn't free to do were the things that probably weren't so good for me, right? And so the thing is, is we want freedom, but the very things we, we want freedom to do aren't necessarily things that are good for us. Many of the things that I wanted the freedom to do and that I then did ended up hurting me. They damaged me. And, and on top of that, some of the things that I chose to do once I had freedom, immediately upon doing them, tried to now take away my freedom. They wanted to be my master for the rest of my life. You, you, oh yeah, you have the freedom to do that. But as soon as you do that, you discover that there's a lot of things in this world that want to be your master. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of stuff that would be more than happy to take the job of master, of controlling your life. So I left the masters of mom and dad, people who definitely had my best interest at heart, and entered a world full of people and habits salivating at the chance to be my new master, just chomping at the bit to take over my life. We want freedom, we crave freedom, and yet what we do with freedom often just gives us new masters. We voluntarily make permanent deals with drugs, alcohol, sexual habits, <coughs> gambling, all kinds of things. We voluntarily enter permanent relationships that we have a very hard time ending. Last week I mentioned that Paul referred to himself as a bond slave of Christ. And a bond slave is a person who voluntarily enters a permanent relationship of service. And the, th the funny thing is, is that Christ is not the only th person we can be a bond slave to. He's just the best person we can be a bond slave to. But there are plenty of other things that we can voluntarily enter that turn out to be a permanent relationship. A permanent re relationship we end up regretting in time. Plenty of things are enslaving that we thought were voluntary. So we're going to talk today about slaves and masters. We're going to talk about who is the master of our life and why it matters. I'm going to talk about two basic points. The first one is the power of Christian ethics. And the second is the conflict of having more than one master. And these go together. Believe it or not, well, we're going to explain and figure out why they go together. 
But let's read the passage. We're in Colossians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 22. This is a passage that I introduced last week. We've read this already, but we went back and really looked at families. Now we're going to look at the other half of this really deeply. This is Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. So let's get the hard part out of the way, first of all. Uh, This is about slavery. Uh, It's not a very fun topic. Um, Greek culture had slaves. uh, Slaves that didn't get to pick their job and they didn't get to quit. Some of them had uh, kind masters. Some of them did not. Some of them had relatively good jobs, high prestige jobs, jobs with perks. Some of them did not have jobs with perks and had very disgusting jobs. And they didn't have many rights, so if you had a cruel master, there wasn't much you can do about it. And maybe even worse, you know, if a person who's living in North Korea right now, they don't have a lot of rights, but neither does their next door neighbor or that person or that person down the road. There are some people over in the government that have rights, but they don't live next door. You know, the people that you're, that you're, you're suffering, but everyone else is suffering the same as you. It's kind of an equal suffering. But these people that were slaves, they had no rights, but they're living with a family that has all kinds of rights. They look just like them. The next door neighbors have rights, and those people over there have rights, and I go to the store and they have rights, but I don't have rights. That had to be hard. It just had to be hard to live in a situation where you could look all around you and see people living a totally different way and you could do nothing to change the circumstances that you're in. It's very hard. As I pointed out last week, Paul does not advocate escape or rebellion. Strangely, he advocates for them to work even harder. He advocates for them to work hard in the circumstance that they're in. And at first, this might seem really unfair. But I'm going to point something out that maybe is hard to see. The point is, is that what Paul does in this passage is actually extremely powerful. Very, very powerful. And in an interesting way, creates freedom where there wasn't any before. Let's see if we can find this. Let's look closely. Verse 23 says, Work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Verse 24, It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. See what's happened here? Who the master is has changed. And then look at verse 4.1. Masters, you also have a master in heaven. I'm going to show you what's happened here. There is a slave, and there is a master, but this slave is no longer ultimately responsible to this master. This slave is ultimately responsible to an eternal, permanent, honest master. And his master is also accountable to that same master, ultimately. They are now equal. They now work for the same person. A same person who will ultimately hand out judgment and fairness and rightness and he will fix it in the end if there was something that was not fair. Christ becomes the judge of reward and punishment for eternity. Slaves and masters are under the same eternal judge. Good slaves gain eternal reward and bad masters gain eternal consequences. Uh, Look, I know this is hard when we're living here on earth, and I I, I get it, but life on earth is as big as the space between my hands right now, and life in heaven is from here to Perth and beyond. 
And, and I know that it's hard to see it that way when we're living in it now, but the truth of the matter is there will be justice and there will be reward and it's going to be okay. This realization is what frees the slave to do their very best without bitterness. Why? Because the realization is, is that my best effort for God's sake is never wasted, and it's never ignored, and it's never forgotten. Ever. Doesn't matter how my boss treats me, if I'm working for God, then my, then my obedience has eternal positive consequences. It lasts forever. God doesn't forget. Even if the project I'm working on fails due to horrific management and there is never any earthly product at all for my labor, if I was working for God and I did it my very best because I was doing it for Christ, my effort lasts forever. My effort lasts for all time. Though the project fail, crash, and burn on earth. First Corinthians 3 talks about gold and silver and precious stones. It's a passage about, you know, at the end there's going to be a judgment. We like to talk about the judgment of, um, of, you know, either you're Christian or not Christian. If you're a Christian, yay. And if you're not a Christian, not so good. We don't, but there's another judgment about how we actually lived as Christians. There's another judgment. We don't like to talk about that one as much. And in that judgment, part of our life, the wood, and stole, you know, the wood hay, and stubble, and gross stuff, that's going to get burned up. And then the good stuff, the gold, silver, and the precious stone, that's going to endure. And there's going to be a judgment. And I don't understand how all this works together. You know, 1 Peter 5 also talks about crowns of glory. And I've heard some theories about this. And look, uh, they're just theories. <laughs> At the end of the day, here's what I know. There's going to be some sort of judgment and some sort of reward for how we lived our life as a Christian. That's true. And I look at passages like this one, and I think about passages like that other one. And I think of the millions of Christians who have regular jobs. And I wonder how many of, that, of those jewels how, many of that gold, how much of that gold and silver is, is produced on the days we hated the most? I mean, days we really couldn't stand. The boss is being a jerk and things are going wrong and on a human level we have every right to complain because on a human level everything was failing. But by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we didn't complain and we did our best and we did it unto the Lord and we came home exhausted and depleted and frustrated and what we don't know is, bing, a sapphire was just added to the crown. On a day we would choose to forget, God can be honored by what we did and that honoring of God will endure forever. forever. I think we're going to be confused. I think I'm going to be, maybe you won't. I think at the new earth and we, we start to interact, you know, we, we think that missionaries and pastors and people like that are going to, I don't know, be the special people. I don't think that's at all going to be true. I think some of the most special, rewarded people, the, the heroes of the faith are going to be people we never noticed on this planet. I think we're going to see some woman with this gorgeous crown. I mean, just stunning. Just a stunning crown. Plain looking woman. And someone's going to say, hey, wait a minute. How'd she get that? Wasn't she a cafeteria lady at a high school for 40 years? What did she do to deserve that? I think Jesus himself is going to be like, ah, shh, you have no idea. You have no idea what that woman through, went through at that school. You don't have any idea how she was treated by those kids. You don't have any idea what happened with the principal or whatever else happened. And she did her job and she represented me. She earned every single bit of that. I might be a minority on this amongst clergy. I don't think the pastor or the missionary are higher calling. I think they're a specific calling 
that not everybody has, and I think God prepares those that he's going to call for that in a special way. But I don't think it's a higher calling. Just as much, if not more, important kingdom work happens in the grocery or the build site or the sports field or the boat ramp. Because that's where we prove the church is real or we don't prove that the church is real. That's where it happens. I can talk all day long about transformation. I can talk till I'm blue in the face. But unless our community sees transformed people being transformed and acting transformed, then where's the evidence of everything that comes from the pulpit? The power of the Christian ethic is the witness to the work of the Holy Spirit. When we do everything we do as if unto Christ, and we do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, that is, that is the witness to the world that Jesus is who he says he is and the Holy Spirit works. That's it. That's the evidence they, they see every day. And they either see it or they do not see it. And that's it. When people see that and they're drawn to that, then it's pretty hard to, to argue with when we say Jesus is real and the Holy Spirit does real things and they've seen our lives and they've seen that it's different and they see that we act different and that our ethics are different and the way we go about everything is different and that there's a different power in what we do. There's nothing they can do and go, I can't tell you that you're a liar. <laughs> I can't call you a liar because everything about you and what your family does, you're not perfect people, and yet there is something different. There's something else. And I can't deny it. And that is so, so, so powerful. And the funny thing is, is that power cannot de be diminished by anyone. <laughs> My decision or your decision or anyone else's decision as a Christian that we're going to do everything we do as unto the Lord, we're going to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, we're going to do it in that attitude. And the witness that, that creates is untouchable. Because if our boss gets worse, the witness gets better. <laughs> the worse the circumstances are, the more it illustrates and illuminates God's grace there is simply nothing anyone can do. Nothing can do anything to stop or diminish the witness of a life dedicated to Christ. It cannot be thwarted. That's power. Because it's unstoppable. Everything anyone might do to stop it only makes it stronger. It's amazing. And so we have this command to slaves to work as if their boss was Jesus. Because the only boss that matters is Jesus. And their new job, their real job, is now to be a living example of the transforming power of God. And where we, they do it isn't the point. In, in the case of a slave, uh, they have no choice as slaves. So they are where they are. They're going to do what they do. So so now they, they need to be that witness of transforming power in the place that they are, doing what they're doing. We have more choices than they had because no one in this room is a slave. But wherever we find ourselves, we still have an obligation to demonstrate the power of God. This principle applies to every Christian. And that means that we should be excellent employees, at least as good as we are capable of being. All of us, as Christians, should be doing whatever we do as if we're doing it for Jesus personally. That means we should be well known for doing our best. And that sounds great, except for one thing. It's one thing to say that Jesus is my sole master, and it is something else entirely to manage to do that. <laughs> to actually live that way, to actually shut out all the rest of it and make Jesus our master. At least I have other masters who want to take over and be the boss. And this is the second topic we're going to look at this morning, the topic of what, who is our master really. I've got a verse for you, Matthew 6, 24. 
No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the context of this verse is a Sermon on the Mount. Maybe you've heard of that sermon. And uh, Jesus has been talking about uh, where we lay up our treasure, whether it's on heaven or earth. And Jesus has been talking about our vision, whether we see things the way God sees things or not. And then he follows up with this verse. And mammon here, if you're wondering what is mammon, mammon is, would be you know, ambition and greed and the desire for power and promotion and, and the desire for importance and affluence and wealth. And the main thing that Jesus, I just want to make sure that we get the main thing. The main thing is Jesus is saying, you cannot live your life trying to be the richest, most powerful, and serve Christ with your whole life at the same time. It will not work. They will be in conflict. If, you're, if your goal in life is to be the most affluent, the best, the most respected, and the wealthiest, that is in conflict, actually, to putting Christ as, as king. I'm not saying that you can't be any of those things. I'm just saying that that can't be your best goal. That can't be your highest priority. I'm not saying that Christians don't ever achieve those things. They do. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that you can't serve two masters is what Jesus said. But there's embedded in this another principle that's also very true. Have any of you had two bosses at the same time? How'd you like that? I bet you didn't. It's really frustrating, isn't it? They never say the same thing. So you have this boss and you talk to him and you say, hey. And they say, you got to do this. And you're like, okay, I'm doing that. And then you're halfway through doing that and the other boss says, hey, I need you to stop that. I need you to do this other thing. So I go, okay, I stop that. And then this one comes up, why aren't you doing the thing I told you to do? And And you feel like you're being ripped in half. It's horrifyingly bad. Everyone in this room who's ever had two bosses knows exactly what I'm saying. Horrible. But the thing is, many want to be master of our life. Our boss at work wants to be our master. Our spouse often wants to be our master. Our kids want to be our master. Our hobbies want to be our master. Our habits and even sometimes our addictions want to be our master. Our church wants to be our master sometimes. I'm going to make a crazy statement coming from a pastor. The church is not Jesus. The church is the bride of Christ. Christ is the head of the church, but the church is not Jesus. One of my pet peeves is when a pastor or leader starts talking as if you have to obey them, as if they were Christ. Who are you? That's not how this works. None of those things, including the church, deserve to be master. But they all clamor for our devotion. And each one usually doesn't care much about the other things in our life so long as we give that master what that master wants. And we get pulled, not just in two directions, but in five. We get get stretched and yanked and and, and everything wants to be in control of what we do next and and where our attention goes. Everything wants to be in control. And it's horrifyingly bad. It's hard. Wouldn't it be nice to only have one? And this is what Jesus offers. Jesus says, become my bondservant. When Jesus is our sole master, everything else works. Why? Because Jesus cares about your job. He wants you to do a good job at work. And unless your boss asks you to do something in direct conflict to what Jesus has asked you to do, you can do what your boss says. The same goes for your family. Jesus wants you to be successful in your family. He really wants you to be successful in your family. And he wants you to be successful in your interests, and he wants you to be successful in your church. And in fact, because of his expert advice in the Bible and the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, when we're following Christ, we can do all those things better than we could have without Christ. He he ups our game in everything. But here's the deal. When we follow Christ, 
Everything else is in the right order. And without Christ, when we start to think that the church is a master and our family is a master, then we have these tensions. Like, especially if we start to think of the church as if it was Jesus, because it's not. And then the church is asking me to do this stuff, but my family's falling apart. But the church really wants me to do this stuff. Well, if, oh, the church, that's more important. That's like God's stuff. So then I let my family crumble because I'm doing more church stuff. God, Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus doesn't want that. And when, we, when Jesus is our master, we keep it in balance. Because we, when Jesus is our master, we understand, yep, Jesus wants to be successful in church and he wants to be successful at home. And we've got to figure out how to do both of those at the same time. And we cannot allow one to crush the other. We can't do that. And I'm not advocating that we abandon what we do at church either. What I'm saying is, when Jesus stays the master, then we can handle all the rest of the conflict because we just do all of it the way Jesus wants to. It'll be great because Jesus wants you to be successful at all this stuff. He wants you to be. And he's ready to empower you to be. And even in your weakness, and he knows that you're trying to do it the way he wants and, and, and we fall short and we don't have enough and, and Jesus provides and he, he gives and, and things that we don't even expect so we can be successful show up. And suddenly it isn't just us trying to succeed. Jesus is on our team to succeed. Things go very different. And all that sounds really nice. I mean, all those habits and addictions that we wish we never gave any attention to. Can Jesus, can Jesus even handle those? Yeah, he can. When Jesus stays the sole master, it all works. But as soon as we start to listen to the demands of some portion of our life and let that thing take over, Everything starts to fall apart. Everything starts to get out of balance. We end up back trying to please all of our masters at the same time, and it's exhausting. And like Jesus said, you're going to love one master and hate the other. You're going to be true to one and despise the other. And at some point, you're going to have to make a choice over what wins. And, and I'm going to choose my family over my job or my job over my family or my church over my stuff. And, and, and when it's all in conflict with each other, we end up taking sides and something crashes and burns. So here's how it all comes together. Jesus tells slaves, quit working for your earthly master and start working for me instead. The single command accomplishes multiple layers of good. <laughs> multiple layers of good suddenly happen when I take my mastership, who's in control of me, and shift it from anybody on this world and I shift it to Christ. One, now I'm operating under the understanding that justice will take place regardless of what the earthly circumstances are like. I don't have to worry about if it's fair. God will make it fair. God will fix all that stuff. It's his job, not my job. Number two, we can let go of worrying whether our boss deserves our loyalty. Don't worry, they don't. They don't. But Jesus does. And so long as we're operating under that understanding that we owe Jesus our loyalty, our performance quits fluctuating based on how we feel about the person who's giving us instructions. We change. And what we can do, change. Number three, it ends the conflict of trying to please everyone. If we please Jesus, and that pleases others, fine. Fine. And if for some reason I'm pleasing Jesus and it doesn't please others, that is also fine. I am fine. I am fine if what I'm doing pleases Jesus and someone else is annoyed by me pleasing Jesus, then this is fine. I, I'm not worried about that conflict. That's, that's okay. And in this bond-slave relationship with Jesus, we achieve freedom. Freedom. You know, I talked at the beginning during the introduction about the fact that I left home at 17 and I had freedom. No resources. You know what the amazing thing is about our freedom in Christ? Why is it freedom in Christ? It's freedom in Christ because I can do things I never could have done before and I have all the resources I need to do it because Jesus supplies what I need 
to obey him. I've got it. I can do it. I can do things I never could have done before. I don't have to look at it and go, I wish I could do that. I wish I could go there. I wish whatever. Nope. When I'm really in line and Jesus is my master, I can do all the things he wants me to do. That's the caveat. All the things he wants me to do. Because when I'm doing what Jesus wants me to do, he will supply what I need to do it. The bottom line is this. We have this passage in Colossians written to people who by every standard of our social justice and and belief of how things work, these people were wronged. These people were... This was was a, a situation that should have been corrected that was unfair. It was patently unfair. And yet... God's instruction for these people in this unfair condition is to represent him always. And there's power that's available to us in our situations when we realize what exactly was happening in that transaction. When we realize that when we make Jesus our master, all kinds of things that are out of whack can be endured or even adjusted to where they need to be because that's who Jesus is and how Jesus works. So as we go out this week, let's do all of our stuff as unto the Lord. And if we're realizing we're doing something that can't be done as unto the Lord, maybe we shouldn't be doing that. We need to be doing something else. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, there are so many practical ways, God, that we could talk about what it means to do things is unto you. But really what it means at the end, I think, God, is you want me to do my best. And the strange thing is, is when I'm doing what you want at my best, sometimes sometimes what happens is your best. And your best is a lot better than my best. And we get to see your power. Lord, I pray for the witness of the church. I pray for the witness of the church worldwide, that that the church, that the people of the church would be showcasing transformed lives. People who don't just have a philosophical difference, they have a substantial, tangible, spiritual difference, that there is something in there that's not easy to explain. In fact, it's impossible to explain that the evidence of your work would be in the people of your church. I pray that for our church. I pray for that for the Australian church. I pray that for the world church. I pray that for every Christian in the world. So much of your work God has done through the day-to-day stuff that we don't even know is a witness. But people are watching And if we're living the way we're supposed to, they know we're Christians. And everything we do and everything we say is either going to bring you credit or it's going to bring you discredit. And so we live diligently knowing that you are the final and true judge. That this is where justice lies that you will judge us simply on how well we represented you in every single thing we did. Whatever it is you handed us from the lowly slave to a politician to a CEO to an engineer to someone surfing what we do is an illustration of who you are. And there's power in that if we'll live in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.